Howdy everyone, thank you for joining me, David Macon, as today we avoid the rules and learn to play Knights of Fire, Battle for Budapest. Now the intent of this video is to not only give you an instructional overview of how to play the game so you can take it from shelf to table as quickly as possible, but along the way I will also be providing you with my strategic insights, commentary, and other discussion points so that you can make an informed and educated decision if whether or not you think this game will be enjoyed by you and your gaming group. Now that being said, I should also say everything that you see here in front of you and throughout the video is a prototype version of the game that was sent to me by the designer so that I could make this Kickstarter preview video for you. So if you'd like to see what the final game looks like, I encourage you to check out the Kickstarter page or the Board Game Geek page depending on when you're actually watching this video. But that being said, the gameplay and the general presentation of the game should remain the same. Now, Date Knights of Fire, Battle for Budapest, picks up the narrative of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution where Days of Ire, Budapest 1956, leaves off. After the first week of the revolution that started as a student demonstration, political changes were sought and demanded by the Hungarian people. At first, the Soviet Politburo suggested that they would negotiate a withdrawal of their forces from Budapest. But evidently they changed their minds because on November 4th they invaded Budapest with the intent to crush the revolution and prove their military might. The Hungarian Revolution had finally captured the full attention of the Soviet Red Army. And this, in fact, is where Knights of Fire Battle for Budapest begins. Knights of Fire is an asymmetric game that can be played with one, two, or three players in two different modes, the Konev and Conflict mode, with two different versions of each mode, the Basic and Advanced versions. Obviously, with so many different ways to play this game, it's going to make the rules video a little bit more complex, but I'm going to do my very best to point out the differences along the way. The Konev mode is cooperative and may be played by one or two players who control the Hungarian side with the revolutionary deck. Optimal hand management is required to effectively allocate action points, or ops as they're called in the game, to the revolutionary insurgents that are represented on the map by these green wooden blocks. The Soviet side is controlled by Marshal Ivan Konev, the Soviet military commander who led Red Army forces on the Eastern Front during World War II, retook much of Eastern Europe from occupation by the Axis powers, and helped in the capture of Germany's capital, Berlin. He is represented by his own 12-card deck that reacts and responds to the revolutionary actions in a fairly swift, efficient, and ruthless way. On the board, there will be Soviet regiments, represented by the hexagonal tokens, and the Soviet garrisons, represented by the triangular tokens. When playing the Konev mode with two players, the revolutionary deck is split between the players according to the two-player symbol shown on the bottom right of the card. Additionally, the players will alternate turns when it is the Hungarian side to perform operations throughout the game. Alternatively, the two players may choose to play against each other in what is referred to as the conflict mode. As in the Konev mode, one player will control the revolutionary side, but now the second player controls the Soviet side with their own deck of cards that obviously has different choices of things to do on them. There are also some additional hand management wrinkles that help control the outcome of any combat the Soviet player initiates, which is one of my favorite parts of the game, but we'll get to that later. Conflict mode is the only mode available to play with three players. As with the two-player Konev mode, there will be two players working cooperatively together to control the Hungarian side to defeat the third player who will be controlling the Soviet side. In addition, both the Konev and Conflict game modes have basic and advanced versions. Frankly speaking, I would not think of either of these versions as being more or less difficult than the other. The advanced version of the game has a few additional things that adds variability and a few more wrinkles to plan around. It is recommended that you save this for your second or third play as the basic version will allow you to focus on the core mechanics of the game. Wow! We haven't even dived into the game yet and we already see all the variability and variety that this asymmetric gameplay will provide you and your game group. Now when you're playing on the Soviet side, there's a completely different gaming experience and learning curve than when you're playing on the Hungarian side. And they're completely different in the way how you feel when you play the game. In addition, the type of game style or mode that you'll be able to play is going to be dependent on your player count. So these are going to be key decision factors for you when you ask yourself, 
what type of style do I like to play? Maybe after a couple plays you prefer Soviet than the Hungarian side or vice versa. And how many people are typically playing this game? And is the style that I prefer playing this game harmonious with the other person? Or do I just like the variety that we're playing and it's all good? So uh, let's hope this video will help you out with some of those decision points as we dive deeper into the video. Now regardless of player count or your chosen game mode, whether it be the Konev mode or the Conflict mode, the victory conditions for this game will remain the same. In addition, your victory will also have different levels. You can either have the prestigious Grand Victory, woohoo, or the not so prestigious Normal Victory, but you'll win nonetheless. So why don't we take a look at how these victory conditions arise. Hungarian morale and Soviet prestige are put to the test in this game and are, in fact, the two main things that determine the game's outcome. Both of these things are tracked here on the board. Soviet prestige is tracked with a red marker. If you are playing the Konev or the basic conflict mode of the game, the Soviet prestige starts at 26. Otherwise, if you are playing the advanced conflict mode, prestige starts a little lower at 23. Hungarian Morel is tracked with a green marker and will always start at 25 regardless of the game mode that you have chosen to play. Although the Morel may increase during the game, by and large the Hungarian Morel will move in a downward direction. The key is to maintain it to live and revolt another round. The game will likely end due to a Hungarian surrender. Now the surrender may either be voluntary as decided by the players who are controlling the Hungarian side or automatic as triggered by some events that occur throughout the game. Now Hungarian surrender does not guarantee that the Hungarians either lost or won, all it does is simply trigger the end of the game. It is the remaining Soviet prestige that's going to decide who's going to be victorious. And in fact, it's going to decide the different levels of victory. Again, whether or not you get a normal victory or a prestigious grand victory. Now, the Hungarians may earn a grand victory in one of two ways. And both of these ways, quite honestly, they're like a unicorn. You kind of heard about them. Maybe they exist. They're kind of like a mythical creature somewhere. But some savvy play testers in the game designer have promised you that these two methods of getting a grand Hungarian victory are indeed valid. So let's check them out. The first way is for the Hungarians to simply survive until the end of the 10th round of the game without surrendering and with at least one insurgent left on the board. This is the true definition of a battle of attrition because your remaining morale will likely be near zero if you make it this long. Knights of Fire is played over a maximum of 10 rounds. I say maximum because honestly, the Soviet army will probably squash the revolution earlier. Each round represents 8 hours of the day, which means that every third round will be played during the night. Some elements of gameplay are affected by whether or not it is a day or night round, which when I show them to you, will make a lot of thematic sense and is another awesome way that this game achieves total thematic immersion into the Hungarian Revolution. The second way for the Hungarians to achieve a grand victory is to decrease Soviet prestige to zero before their ultimate surrender. Prestige is adjusted at the end of each round, so you will still need at least one insurgent to survive the entire round that this happens. To achieve a grand Hungarian victory, it is going to require a lot of calculated risk and frankly speaking, a little luck too. Historically speaking, a grand Hungarian victory was extremely unlikely, which is something the designers preserved in the game. The game is designed to demolish the Hungarians and squash their morale, which the Hungarians will have to fiercely protect. Like any revolution, the morale of the revolutionaries is of the utmost importance. If morale is destroyed too quickly and efficiently, well then, the revolution is also destroyed. Like Soviet prestige, morale is only adjusted at the end of each round, but it is adjusted after the prestige. This works to your advantage as you may make a push for one of these victory conditions during a final round of desperation. But hold on! I just said that a grand revolutionary victory is made to be nearly impossible. So what hope does the Hungarian side have? Have no fear, next we have the normal revolutionary victory. A normal revolutionary victory occurs after a Hungarian surrender and after an end of game prestige adjustment. If at this time the Soviet prestige equals zero, the Hungarian side may bask in their normal victory. But it's a victory nonetheless. Woohoo! Now to be clear, this is different than a grand victory because it occurred after a Hungarian surrender and after the end of game prestige adjustment, which is different than the end of round prestige adjustment, which typically occurs. So to understand this, we need to appreciate a Hungarian surrender a little bit better and we need to understand the end of game prestige adjustment better. 
At the end of each round, after each side has performed their tactical operations to either survive, which is the case with the Hungarian side, or pound and destroy is the case with the Soviet side, there's what we call the adjustment phase. Now during this phase, among other things, the Soviet prestige will be adjusted, as will the Hungarian morale. Now nestled around the adjustment phase is the opportunity for the Hungarian side to in fact surrender. And again, this surrender may be voluntary or it may be automatic depending on what the game state currently is. So to understand this better, let's go through the adjustment phase. If you're playing the advanced conflict mode, the very first thing you evaluate is whether or not the Soviet player accomplished the current round's headline. The headline deck consists of a series of political events that provides focus and variability to the Soviet player by providing a new objective each round. If the Soviet player accomplished the objective, shown here with this check, earlier in the operations phase, which we'll talk about, don't worry, then this part of the adjustment phase is skipped. If the Soviet player has failed to accomplish this objective, then he suffers a penalty, shown here with this red X. The penalty may either be immediate and discarded from the game, or permanent and lasts for the remainder of the game. Again, these headlines are only played with in the advanced conflict mode, as they require a human to be controlling the Soviet side. When playing any other mode, this step is skipped entirely. Next, we adjust the Soviet prestige. During the round's operations phase, the revolutionists will earn momentum tokens when they take certain actions against the Soviets. These tokens are cashed in at this time. For every two tokens the Hungarian side has in front of them, the Soviet prestige decreases by one. Or put another way, each of these tokens is worth minus half a prestige each. After adjusting prestige, the tokens are returned to the supply. If there is an odd number of tokens, the Hungarian side keeps one of them to use during the next round's adjustment phase. Now do you remember the Grand Revolutionary Victory? Well, if at this time the Soviet prestige equals zero, or if you made it to the end of the 10th round, well, woohoo! A grand revolutionary victory may be declared at this time if either of those two things are satisfied. But in the likely event that none of those two things have been satisfied, then you'll proceed on with the game and see if the Hungarian side in fact surrenders. A Hungarian surrender automatically occurs if there are no armed insurgents left on the board. In the basic version of the game, all insurgents are considered to be armed, regardless of the icons that show on their insurgent block. However, if you are playing the advanced version of the game, some of your insurgents are what are called innocent bystanders, as indicated by their peaceful dove icons. As their name implies, these insurgents are not armed. In addition, there can be no Hungarian civilians left on the board. Hungarian civilians are represented by these square tokens. They have a lot of impact on gameplay and final scoring, which I'll expand on momentarily. Now, if there's at least one armed insurgent on the board and or one civilian on the board, then the Hungarian surrender is not automatically triggered. However, the Hungarian side may still choose to voluntarily surrender at this time if they have six or less armed insurgents remaining on the board. Again, recall that the definition of an armed insurgent varies between the advanced and basic versions of the game. If the Hungarian side does surrender, either automatically or voluntarily, there will be an end of game prestige adjustment. Now, as I've already mentioned, this prestige adjustment does not occur if the revolutionists won in a very grand way. But this is the likely scenario that you'll be playing most of the time. So this end of game prestige adjustment has two steps. First, decrease the Soviet prestige by half the amount of remaining armed insurgents on the board. And good news, if there's an odd number of armed insurgents, round up! This prestige adjustment is a key reason why the Hungarian side may choose to voluntarily surrender instead of fighting to the total death. Since you cannot voluntarily surrender with seven or more armed insurgents left, this prestige adjustment will decrease Soviet prestige by a maximum of three. Secondly, Soviet prestige is reduced by the value indicated on the Hungarian civilian tokens in the fled civilians area here on the board. The Hungarian civilians that get caught between the Hungarian revolutionaries and their Red Army add an extremely interesting twist and a wonderful flavor to this game. The game starts with 10 civilians scattered around the city. Each civilian token has a value of 0, 1, or 2 printed on their back, which basically represents their influence and power. During the game, the Hungarian side will help these civilians flee the city so they may go tell the Western world of their revolution and of the Soviet oppression. Obviously, the civilians with more power and influence will be the ones most listened to by the outside world and will decrease the Soviet prestige the most. 
If the Soviet player wants to win, he needs to prevent these civilians from fleeing because this game and prestige adjustment often swings the victory from one side to the other. The Soviets will try to arrest these civilians before they have a chance to flee. This not only decreases the number of civilians that can be used for this final game and prestige adjustment, but the arrested civilians also lower Hungarian morale, which, as we know by now, is not a good thing. This is why, as you may notice, that some civilians have a value of zero on them. Even if they flee the city, they'll have no influence whatsoever in the Western world and will have no effect on Soviet prestige. However, they can still be arrested to lower Hungarian morale, which is a bad thing. Obviously, the Soviet player is incentivized to kidnap the highest valued civilians as it solves multiple problems by decreasing the amount of prestige that they'll lose at the end of the game, as well as decreasing Hungarian morale during the game. It should be noted that the civilian tokens are placed face up when playing the cooperative Konev mode, they are placed face down when playing the conflict mode and are hidden from the Soviet player. The Hungarian side is free to remind themselves of the values at any time. This is, after all, not a memory game. Now these civilians just provide a ton of fun into this game and they're one of my favorite things because as the Hungarians player, you're trying to get these civilians out. You're trying to flee them because you want them to go and use them at the end of the game for the prestige adjustment. So the higher the better. The most influential civilians are going to be the ones that are going to be most benefit to you at the end of the game. But if you're showing too much focus on certain civilians, then the Soviet player might go, hmm, you seem to really care about that little guy over there. Maybe I should should focus on him so it adds this cat and mouse element to the game where maybe you can use certain civilians as bait and then be able to use that distraction to the Soviet player to get other civilians out but you can't forget about even your lowest valued civilians because they count against your morale as well if the Soviet player is able to arrest them so there's just a lot of really interesting decisions and kind of cat and mouse and baiting that goes on with these civilians and I think it's just a wonderful element to the game. Finally, after a Hungarian surrender and after the game and prestige adjustment, we can declare a winner. There are three possible outcomes. If Soviet prestige now equals zero, the revolutionary side earns a normal victory. If Soviet prestige is one, two, or three, the Soviet side earns a normal victory. It is interesting to note that the actual historical outcome of this revolution falls within this range. And finally, if Soviet prestige is four or higher, the Soviets are rewarded with a grand victory. Their campaign of retribution was swift, ruthless, and successful. So those are the ways to win. Basically, the Hungarians want to keep Morel up for a long enough time so that they can decrease Soviet prestige to zero. There are two additional steps that I have not talked about in the adjustment phase. The Hungarian morale adjustment as well as the Soviet tactics adjustment. These two adjustments will make a lot more sense after we talk a little bit more about the gameplay and the game flow. Now to appreciate the gameplay, we need to create some definitions here first so the rest of the video makes sense. Now to do that, I think it would be best to go through some steps of the setup to show you the different definitions. Now I'm not going to go through every step, but you can follow that along in the rule book at your leisure. The board is a map of Budapest, which is divided into three divisional sectors, as defined by the Soviet regiments that invaded. When talking to the designers, special attention was given to the historical accuracy of the regiment names, which certainly enhances the historical context and flavor. Each sector is further divided into districts. Some districts have key military targets and objectives in them. These are indicated by the labeled objective stars. The districts with objective stars are important for gameplay, especially in the Konev mode as they help direct the automated Konev bot, but also for setup. There are two things that are required during setup in these objective districts. First, randomly place one local Hungarian insurgent. These are special insurgents. They have two icons on them, which will give them the flexibility to do more stuff. But they are not allowed to move during the game. They will stay in the same district all game. Whereas the fighter insurgents have only one icon on them, which will give them less flexibility in what they can do, but are free to move about the city. At the beginning of the game, 
All districts will start with one fighter insurgent. The remaining fighter insurgents are placed in the insurgent reinforcement box to be added at a later time. All insurgents start off hidden from the Soviet side, which means that their stickered side can only be seen by the Hungarian side. If during gameplay the insurgent becomes revealed, then the insurgent is flipped to its flat side with the sticker side up so everyone can see him. Thematically, the local insurgents represent the Hungarians who feel the call to action when they see the fighting insurgents revolting in their district and decide to join them. Being locals, this is their home district, which makes them a little more knowledgeable on the ins and the outs of the area, which makes them more flexible and versatile. And of course, they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay and defend their homes. Secondly, the civilians who do not feel the call to actively join the revolution are randomly placed in the same districts as the local insurgents. Recall that when playing the combat mode, the civilian value is hidden from the Soviet player, but may be viewed by the Hungarian side at any time. Each divisional sector starts with two active Soviet regiments in a staging area, ready to move in, and one active Soviet regiment in the district adjacent to the staging area. The Soviet regiments stay in their divisional sector for the entire game. They cannot move across sector boundaries. The Soviet garrisons are placed to the side for now, as they can only be added to the board by active Soviet regiments later. Active Soviet units, whether they be regiments or garrisons, may become disabled during gameplay. If so, they are simply flipped over to their disabled side. When disabled, the Soviet units cannot do anything. However, However, all disabled Soviet units become active again at the end of each round during the cleanup phase. Ouch! The Soviet readiness starts at a value of 3 on the readiness track. Personally, I call this the Soviet cockiness track. The Soviets have low readiness. It means that they are overly cocky about the situation at hand and are not very vigilant. It implies that they are taking their revolutionists too lightly. After all, why should they be worried? It's just a ragtag group of revolutionaries up against a mighty red army. Right? The Hungarian side will be forced to take risks that will be dependent on how ready the Soviets are. The less ready, the better. When playing the Konev mode, the severity of some of Marshal Konev's decisions will also depend on how ready the Soviets are. This is a really cool track and element to the game. How it can be manipulated and influence decisions for both sides will be discussed later. The Soviet side is given the appropriate deck, depending on the game mode that is being played. The Konev deck or the Soviet tactics deck if playing combat mode. If you're playing the advanced conflict mode. The headline deck is shuffled and placed to the side face down. And finally, this is what the game looks like set up for a two-player conflict mode advanced version of the game. Finally, let's play. I've structured the video in such a way so that when we go through the gameplay elements that we'll have a better appreciation as to why we want to do certain things because now we understand what it is we're trying to work towards. So this game has a maximum of 10 rounds and each round has six phases. In order, these phases are number one, the Hungarian draw phase, number two, the Soviet tactics phase, number three, the Hungarian reinforcement phase, number four, the operations phase. Now this is kind of the battle arena where everything occurs on the board that's the real meat of the game number five we have the adjustment phase and finally number six we have the cleanup phase so i will go through these in order but i will still jump around a little bit when i see fit to relate one part of the gameplay to another part of the gameplay First we have the draw phase which is only relevant to the hungarian side the soviet side does nothing now remember how important morale is in preventing the Hungarian surrender? Well, it is also important for how many cards the revolutionists can draw. If there's only one revolutionary player, he or she may draw 12 new cards from the revolutionary deck if their morale is 19 or more. If, however, their morale is 18 or less, they only draw 8 cards. Wow! That is a huge reduction! Remember these cards contain those ever so critical ops values on them that allow us to do cool revolutionary stuff later. If playing with two revolutionary players, they each get to draw seven cards if their morale is 19 or greater. Otherwise, they'll both draw five cards. After you draw your cards, you check your hand limit, which is 12 for a single revolutionary player and eight to playing with two revolutionary players. It is possible it will be over your hand limit because you may hold cards from round to round. So what is the best way to squash a revolution? Well, to deprive the revolutionists of their spirit and their resolve and morale. And that's what makes this part of the game so awesome because right out of the gates, right from round one, the Soviet player is incentivized to drive down the Hungarian morale as quickly and as efficiently as possible because the effects of dropping the morale below 19 are just crippling to the Hungarian side. 
The second phase is the tactics phase, and this phase is only relevant to the Soviet side. This is where the Soviet side is going to figure out how they're going to lay the hammer and sickle down on the Hungarian Revolution. Now, this phase plays differently depending on which mode that you're playing in, and I'm going to have to discuss them in separate parts of the video. So let's start with the Konev mode. The Soviet side is controlled by the Marshal Konev deck. Each round, five cards from the Konev deck will be resolved. The tactics phase is when these five cards are chosen. First, take the top three cards from the Konev deck, lay them face down in a row, and flip over and reveal the first and third cards, leaving the middle card face down. Then, shuffle the discard pile from the previous round with the cards remaining in the deck. Obviously, if this is the first round, this step will be skipped. Draw another two cards from the newly shuffled deck and add them to the end of the card row. Flip over and reveal the last or fifth card in the row. Next, place the five target tokens on each card. All of the cone of cards will be activated and utilized later. The order in which they will be activated will be controlled by a six-sided die which corresponds to these tokens. Now the way in which the cone of cards are laid out is fantastic. There is both hidden and revealed information that are resolved in an unknown order. However, there are a few ways for the Hungarian side to mitigate the unknown and even control the cards available during this tactics phase. This mitigation starts in the previous round's adjustment phase, so let's jump ahead to the adjustment phase to appreciate the impact it has on this tactic phase. At the end of the adjustment phase, there's a Soviet tactical adjustment that is triggered if three or more Soviet units are disabled. For every third disabled Soviet unit, the Hungarian side may choose any two cone of cards that they want to temporarily remove from the game. These two cards will not be available during the tactics phase of the following round. If the cards are chosen correctly, it is extremely beneficial to the Hungarian side. This benefit is certainly something to keep in the back of your mind as you make operational decisions and will often influence them. Disabling Soviet units is also advantageous during the tactics adjustment phase when playing the conflict mode of the game. For every third disabled Soviet unit, a tactics card is randomly drawn from the Soviet player's tactics deck and placed face up to the side and is unavailable for the Soviet player to choose in the next round's tactics phase. The Soviet player does have a little control over at least one card that cannot be removed from the next round. It may happen that the Soviet player will pass during the operations phase, which we'll discuss, with one or more tactics cards remaining in his or her hand. If so, he gets to keep exactly one card, which is placed to the side until the next round's tactics phase. This card is unavailable for the Hungarian side to randomly draw and remove if they have successfully disabled three Soviet units. So why did I skip ahead to the previous round's adjustment phase when all we want to talk about is this round's tactics phase? First, the Soviet player examines the entire deck of tactics cards and may select a total of six cards minus the number of face-up cards that became unavailable in the previous round's adjustment phase. So for example, if two cards were made unavailable in the previous adjustment phase due to there being six to eight disabled Soviet units on the board, then the Soviet player may only choose four cards from the remaining tactics cards. The Soviet player kept one card from the previous round, he then adds it back to his hand at this time. So the Soviet player may have a maximum of seven cards in his hand if all cards were available to him, meaning he had two or fewer disabled units and he kept one card from passing during the previous round. Obviously, if this is the first round, the Soviet player will simply choose six cards. Finally, all remaining tactics cards are shuffled together and placed to the side. This new deck is referred to as the combat deck and will be used to resolve Soviet attacks in the operations phase. After the Soviet player has selected the appropriate amount of tactics cards, he or she will flip over the top headline card if they are playing the advanced version of the game. This represents a political event as indicated by the card's title that the Soviet player needs to address during this round, or else it will be to the Hungarian side's benefit. Well, expect a little analysis paralysis from the Soviet side, because there's a lot of things to consider here. Now, with experienced play, you may want to combine the Hungarian draw phase and the Soviet tactics phase together, since both phases affect different sides of the board independently. Now, the Soviet tactics cards are what he's going to use to control what he does during the operations phase. So why don't we talk about the tactics cards, their anatomy and iconology, and also the operations phase from the Soviet player's point of view, since both of these things are so intertwined. Now, during the operations phase, each operations phase will start with the Hungarian side starting first, followed by the Soviet side, and back and forth we go until both sides have passed. But for now, we'll focus on the Soviet player's turn. 
On his turn, the Soviet player must play one or two tactics cards from his hand or pass. The top three quarters of the card show various action icons with a number that indicates the maximum number of times that particular action can be taken. The Soviet player may take these actions in any order that he or she wants and may even choose not to take some of the actions at all. He may even play a single card, take a few actions, then choose to play his second card later. There is complete flexibility in how these actions are taken. However, there are two key restrictions when executing these actions. First, all of the actions that the Soviet player takes in a given turn must be taken in the same divisional sector. Second, most actions may only be carried out by an active Soviet regiment. Assume that this is the case, unless I indicate otherwise in the video. So even though this game is all about the Soviets completely crushing the revolution, this added wrinkle keeps the Soviet player in check. And in this game, a cat and mouse, it ensures that the cat can't be everywhere at the same time where the mouse is scurrying off to. So it forces the Soviet player to make some tough decisions and allocate his resources on the board wisely. So what do these icons mean, and what actions can the Soviet player take? First, let's talk about the fun stuff, the attack actions. There are two ways in which the Soviet player may attack the revolutionary side, the strongest being the assault action. For each assault action, flip over the top card of the combat deck, which as you recall was hand selected by you during the tactics phase. On the bottom quarter of the tactics cards, there are three numbers. The rightmost number, which is also tagged with the assault icon, indicates the maximum damage an assault inflicts on the revolutionaries that are unfortunate enough to be in the same district as the assaulting regiment. I say maximum because the assault damage is decreased by one for every barricade and rubble token in the district. It is to the revolutionists' advantage to build barricades and to use existing rubble to mitigate the damage incurred by Soviet assaults. Rubble, however, is only a part of the game if playing the advanced version and is created when the Soviets launch extremely powerful attacks. If the assault value shown on the combat card is 3 or greater, a rubble token is added to the district after the total damage is determined. Newly added rubble does not impact the current attack. Although there can only be one barricade per district, there can be multiple rubble tokens from repeated attacks. Rubble is such a great and thematic addition to the game. There's no such thing as clean tank warfare. When the tanks come rolling through the street, they're going to be blasting things up. Buildings, infrastructure, cars, all of these things are going to get blown up and they're going to create these piles of rubble, which the revolutionists can use their advantage to hide behind and they even slow the progress of the regiments as they move through the city. But at the same token, it's a bit of a consolation prize because that also means that some serious damage and some serious attacking has also incurred. To make future attacks more powerful, the Soviet side may remove one barricade or rubble token, again only in the advanced game, by taking the clear action. Once the final damage is determined, the Soviet player will place the same number of wound tokens on the Hungarian insurgents in the district in which the attack occurred. It only takes two wounds to kill an insurgent. If killed, the insurgent is removed from the board and placed in the killed arrested units box. So this is good for the Soviet side, right? Removing these pesky revolutionary insurgents only weakens their cause, right? For the most part, yes, this is a great thing for the Soviets. This is one of the ways in which morale will be adjusted in the adjustment phase at the end of the round. For every two units that are in the killed arrested units box, Hungarian morale would decrease by one. Or in other words, each unit killed is worth half a morale decrease, which by now we know is something extremely important to the Soviet side. However, if you are playing the advanced version, an innocent bystander may be killed in the attack, which will cause outrage in the world press. Oh no! The Soviet prestige decreases by one for every innocent bystander killed using the assault action. Obviously. This is very bad. Wouldn't it be nice for the Soviet player to be able to recon the district to help avoid this pesky public relations mess? He can, and he will if he takes the recon action indicated by this eyeball icon. This action allows the Soviet player to reveal one hidden insurgent in a district with an active regiment. And for their vigilance, the Soviet readiness increases by one. And finally, this action cannot be taken at night, which makes thematic sense. Oh. And I've got some bad news for the Soviets. This isn't just a one-way attack. After every assault action, the Hungarians may counterattack 
and inflict some damage of their own. If there is a Hungarian insurgent in the same district where the Soviet attack occurred with a counterattack icon on him, that insurgent may counterattack by playing a total of three ops, using one or more cards from their hand, provided that one of the cards played also has the matching counterattack icon on it. This is allowed even if the counterattacking insurgent was killed in the initial attack. Their counterattack represents their final and heroic last stand. As a result, the attacking Soviet regiment is disabled and flipped over. Woohoo! The Hungarians are not going down without a fight. However, the Soviet regiment may only be temporarily crippled and disabled. The Soviet player may activate any disabled unit, regiment, or garrison by taking the rally action. But who cares? Now the Soviet player has to spend time fixing his tanks and putting band-aids on his soldiers instead of steamrolling the revolution. Any tactic that delays the Soviet onslaught is a good tactic in this game. The rally action cannot be taken after the Hungarian side has passed, however. That wouldn't be very sporting, now would it? But wait! There's more! The Hungarian player who is able to perform the counter-attacking action also gets to draw one card from the top of the revolutionary deck back into their hand. So that's huge in a game of hand management and action point allowance or ops points management when you can inflict damage on the other side while still maintaining your hand somewhat. That's a really big benefit. But unlike any of the Hungarian attack actions, you do not gain a momentum token for doing so. Instead, it's the card that you're going to draft into your hand, which is also awesome. To conclude on the assault action, it does have some unique restrictions. First, it cannot be taken on night turns. So remember this during your first game when you're choosing cards in the tactics phase. Assault action icons will do you no good, but the three cards you find these icons still provide some very useful options for you to consider. And second, once an active regiment takes an assault action, it cannot take any more actions that turn. So plan carefully. The second, final, and less powerful attack action is the probe action. But unlike the assault action, the probe action may be taken in both the day and night rounds, but with varying degrees of success. As done with the assault action, the Soviet player flips over the top card of the combat deck. With the probe action, we're now only interested in the first two numbers on the bottom of the card. The leftmost number is the maximum damage inflicted during the day, whereas the center number is the maximum damage inflicted during the night. The Soviet player cannot probe in the district with the barricade, so the total damage inflicted by the probe action is only modified by the number of rubble tokens in the district if you're playing the advanced version of the game. Rubble is created when the maximum revealed pro damage is 3 or higher, just as we did with the assault action. The Soviet player needs to be keenly aware of what time of day it is, because these slight variations in what you can or cannot do during the night phase creates a pulse and thematic rhythm throughout the course of the game that may provide little opportunities or perhaps some hurdles to you in what you want to do, depending on what side of the board you're on. Once the final damage is determined, Deal it out! Remove any insurgents that have two wound tokens to the killed arrested box. Now there is a key distinction between the assault and probe actions when insurgents get killed. If playing the advanced version of the game, the innocent bystanders that get killed during an assault action will decrease Soviet prestige by one. However, if they are killed during a probe action, the Soviet prestige is unaffected. As with the assault action, the Hungarian side may also counter-attack after every Soviet probe action in exactly the same way I have already described. Decisions, decisions, decisions. There's so many great things to consider here. Should I assault? Should I probe? Can I assault? What time of day is it? Can I probe? Is there a barricade in the district? Should I clear? Can I rally? Do I need to worry about a Hungarian counterattack? Whoa, it is just mind blowing the things you need to consider when you're choosing your tactics cards. But then in addition, you need to choose them in such a way that you're creating a combat deck that will ensure a high probability of success should you choose to attack. I personally love these multi-purpose cards and the way that you create a deck basically from the leftovers of the deck of what you're going to be doing in that round is just a really awesome element to the game and it's just one of my favorite things when you're playing as a Soviet player. Now let's revisit this box for killed insurgents and arrested civilians. We have figured out how to kill the insurgents by assaulting and probing, but who do we arrest and how do we do it? The arrest action, triggered by the handcuff icon, is how the Soviet player captures a civilian. This does two very important things. First, it prevents the civilian from fleeing and being used for the final game and prestige adjustment. And second, it is used during the adjustment phase at the end of each round when the Hungarian morale is adjusted. For every two Hungarian units, regardless if they are killed insurgents, 
insurgents or arrested civilians that are in this box, morale will decrease by one. These units are then cleared from the board. It is important to note that an arrest cannot be made in a district with a revealed insurgent. All insurgents in that district must be hidden for an arrest to occur. This is an extremely important rule for the Hungarian side to remember because it is unlikely that you'll get to all of your civilians before the Soviets do, but you can still offer them some protection by having a revealed insurgent. Arresting civilians and killing insurgents is one way for the Soviet side to drive down the Hungarian morale, but there is another way to influence Hungarian morale that both the Soviet side and Hungarian side can do in their favor, and it involves the Soviet garrisons. With this icon, a Soviet player may use an active Soviet regiment to add one Soviet garrison to a district with an objective star. Once placed, the Soviet garrison never moves. There can only be one garrison per district. The astute observer will note that there are 10 garrison tokens and exactly 10 districts with objective stars. It is important to make a clear distinction between the Soviet regiments and the Soviet garrisons. Now, the Soviet regiments are the things that do. These are the things that move about the board and accomplish the different operations that the Soviet side would like to accomplish. So if you're on the Hungarian side and things are starting to heat up a little bit for you, you may be wanting to focus on the Soviet regiments so that you can lower the heat so to speak. The Soviet garrisons, they don't do anything, but they come into play at the end of the round during the adjustment phase and will affect your morale so that you have those two different decisions of what's important to you at that particular time in the game as to what it is that you really want to disable and target. During the adjustment phase, every third disabled garrison will actually increase revolutionary morale by one. Woohoo! Whereas every third enabled garrison will decrease morale by one. The garrisons will influence the Hungarian morale one way or another. It simply depends on whose side you're on, if it is good or bad. If you're playing the advanced version of the game, a revealed Hungarian insurgent with a defiant symbol, shown here, can block an active garrison in its district from counting towards decreasing revolutionary morale. So, for example, if there are four active garrisons on the board, but two are in the same districts as revealed, defiant insurgents, then you only consider two garrisons when determining if morale should decrease. Since there is less than three garrisons, morale will stay the same. If you're playing the Soviet side, you may want to think about putting as many as these Soviet garrisons out on the board as fast as possible, because they are complete morale crushers. The more you have out there, the more difficult it will be for the Hungarian side to manage. Now, if you're on the Hungarian side of the board, always remember the power of three. If there are three active garrisons on the board, make it two. If there are six active garrisons on the board, make it five, because both cases will make a difference of one whole morale, which may make the difference of how long you actually stay in the game. Now this is another reason which I've already mentioned as to why the Soviet player cannot take the rally action after the Hungarian player has passed because the Hungarian player may have already calculated which units are actually disabled and, and which units are actually active and what will be used for the adjustment phase at the end of the round and so it would be very sporting now for the Soviet player to change that game state after the Hungarian player has passed. We have talked about all the cool things a Soviet player can do with his active regiments, but how does he get them to where he wants to do stuff? Well, he takes the move action, indicated by this icon, which allows him to move an active regiment to an adjacent district within the same divisional sector. The divisional sector that the regiment tokens belong to are clearly marked on the tokens and on the board. Adjacency is really simple. Trace your finger from one district to another. If your finger crosses exactly one district boundary line and remains in the same divisional sector, then the districts are considered adjacent. If there are multiple move actions available, they may be used on the same active regiment or split between active regiments as a Soviet player sees fit. If you plan on moving an active Soviet regiment across several districts on the same turn, you need to be aware of the pinning rule. Now, even though the Soviet side is a rather overconfident bunch when it comes to this revolution, they are still vigilant enough to check out things that look suspicious and that may be a potential problem to them. So when they enter a district, if they see one of three things that look suspicious, they are not allowed to exit the district on the same turn because they're going to stop and investigate. A revealed insurgent, a barricade, which obviously means that some insurgents have been lurking around to build it, or if playing the advanced version of the game, 
rubble. Some of their comrades have been there before and have shot some rounds off. What did they see that you haven't? Perhaps you should stop and take a look. Now the pinning rule is something that you might casually gloss over the first time you're reading the rule book and might not give too much thought or consideration to, but it is an extremely important strategic rule that the Hungarian side may use to its advantage at during critical times throughout the game to either funnel the Soviet player during a certain path that they'd like them to go or to even impede or slow his progress. It is in fact all about creating chaos and distractions for the Soviet player and slowing him down so that the Hungarian player may live to fight the revolution another day. If you're playing the advanced version, the final action the Soviet player may take in the operations phase is to resolve the headline that was previously revealed in the tactics phase. Once the Soviet player meets the headline conditions, he may play a tactics card from his hand that has the headline icon on it. This tactics card does not count as a card played this turn. The Soviet player must still play at least one and a maximum of two additional tactics cards. For example, the current round headline is Armed Resistance at Sespel Island. The Soviet player must have as many active garrisons on the map as the current turn number. Any time during his turn that this condition is met, the Soviet player may choose to resolve this headline. So what are the benefits of resolving a headline? The obvious benefit is to avoid the negative consequence of not resolving the headline, which as you recall is the first thing done in the adjustment phase. Secondly, Soviet prestige increases by one. Woohoo! Remember how the victory conditions are directly linked to the amount of Soviet prestige remaining? Well, if the Soviet side completes enough objectives throughout the game, it can be quite detrimental to the Hungarians' chance of winning. And finally, the Soviet side may repeat an action that they have already taken this turn. This game has so much variability baked into it. We have the different game modes, the Konev mode, the conflict mode. We have the different versions of each mode, the basic, the advanced. We also have the asymmetric gameplay. But guess what? The Soviet player gets even more variability added when he plays with these Soviet headline cards. Now these headline cards will provide the Soviet player an extra layer of decision to make on what might otherwise be a straightforward turn because he's incentivized to actually accomplish these cards so that he doesn't get penalized at the end of the round. Now the other thing that I think is quite interesting about these cards is that they are revealed during the tactics phase after the Soviet player has actually chosen his tactics cards for the upcoming round. So what does that mean? Well, there's only four tactics cards in the Soviet player's deck that actually have the resolve headline icon on it. So he has to plan ahead. He doesn't know what's coming down the pipe. He doesn't know what the headline is. So he's trying to resolve his tactics and trying to get cards so he can plan that. He's trying to manage his combat deck that he's going basically going to be the leftover of his cards. But all the while he's like, well, I know a headline's coming up and it's going to probably be pretty damaging if I don't accomplish it. So I still need to keep a card with a headline headline icon on it, but what icons am I giving up for my other operations that I'm going to be doing, either my combat deck or into my tactics themselves. So there's just some really great decisions that are just even added to the actual card selection when you know that you have this unknown headline coming down the pipe at you. So I skipped ahead a little, but I thought it made sense to include both the Soviet operations and tactics phase together for when you're playing the conflict mode, since after all it is the tactics cards that influence what you're doing in your operation phase. We're going to jump back now to phase 3, which is only relevant to the Hungarian side, and it's the reinforcement phase. Now the reinforcement phase is the same whether you're playing the Konev mode or the conflict mode, and it is completely optional every round if the Hungarian player would like to do that. In addition, this phase is skipped during the first round of the game. If you recall that during setup we placed the remaining seven fighter insurgents here in the insurgent reinforcement box. These insurgents are recruited and called to action by the Hungarian side during the reinforcement phase. The Hungarian side may play exactly one card with the reinforcement icon on it. The maximum number of insurgents that may be recruited is equal to the ops value on the card played. For example, this card has an ops value equal to 2, which allows you to move up to two insurgents from the insurgent reinforcement box to either the same or different districts on the board. These newly recruited insurgents may only move to a district that does not have a Soviet garrison present or contains at least one other insurgent. There's going to be a lot of important and timely decisions that the Hungarian side is going to be forced to make during the reinforcement phase. Of course you have the obvious questions such as, 
What type of insurgent do I need to get on the board? How many insurgents do I need to get on the board? Where should I put these insurgents? But you need to go one step further in your thinking. You go, but how does this impact my operations phase? Because that one card you play for the reinforcement phase is now out. It's out of your hand. You don't have that available to you during the operations phase. So there's a real opportunity cost here between getting your insurgents onto the board and what you might be able to do later. So if you get lots of insurgents on the board, meaning you used a high ops valued card, Hard, well, that might take away your ability to maybe build a barricade or, a, or ambush or do something cool later in the round. So you have to make that decision. Now, me personally, I prefer to get as many insurgents out onto the board during the reinforcement phase as early as possible. In particular, I like to get it while my morale is still 19 or higher, where my hand size is in fact bigger. So I feel less bad about burning a high ops valued card because I know during the operations phase, I'll still be able to accomplish a lot by combining multiple cards or lower valued cards to still build my barricades, still ambush and still do, do those cool things. But once my hand size gets reduced after morale drops below below 19, then I'm a little bit more stingy as to how I want to be using these cards. And it's that point in time that I hope most of my insurgents are out in play. But that's something for you to discover as to what works best for your strategy and your game group. Seeing that we're starting to take a closer look here at the iconology of the Hungarian insurgent blocks, as well as the revolutionary deck, now is a good time to just jump right on into the operations phase as viewed from the Hungarian side. Now the operations phase will be played the same whether or not you're playing the Konev mode or the conflict mode, but one thing to mention is whether or not you're playing with one player or two players on the Hungarian side. Now if you're playing with two players, they will alternate turns between themselves and the Soviet side. So say for example you have player A and player B, both on the Hungarian side and myself being the Soviet player. So player A will start the operations phase from the Hungarian side and then I'll go to the Soviet's turn and then I'll go back to the Hungarian side but this time it'll be player B who plays then it comes back to the Soviet side then we go back to the Hungarian side now player A and so on and so forth until both sides have passed. Now if one of the Hungarian players has passed it is considered that both of them have passed. On their turn the Hungarian side must play one two or three revolutionary cards from their hand or pass. The majority of the card is consumed by really cool thematic artwork. The ops value is printed in the top left corner and may be a value of either one, two or three. Every action will require a certain number of ops. Although multiple cards may be used and added together to have the appropriate amount of ops to complete one action, one card's ops may never be split between multiple actions. Below the ops value are icons that are required for specific actions. We have already discussed the counterattack and recruit icons, as these are the two different actions the Hungarian side may take outside of the operations phase. So let's focus on what the Hungarian side can do during the operations phase. First, the Hungarian side may move. Their fighter insurgents. These again are the insurgents with only one icon on them. If you recall our discussion about the local insurgents, you will remember that they cannot move from the district that they were placed in during setup. For one ops, a fighter or a group of fighters may move to an adjacent district. Multiple ops can be spent to move multiple groups, the same group multiple times, or both. Unlike the Soviet definition of adjacency, the Hungarian side may consider districts in different divisional sectors as being adjacent and have more freedom to move about the city. The fighter insurgents may also cross the Danube River from one district to another, provided that the district borders project across the river in a manner that would make them adjacent. For example, District 1 is adjacent to Districts 5A and 5B, but it is not adjacent to District 9. Civilians may not be moved, but you can help them flee. This is, as you will recall, one of the most effective ways to drop Soviet prestige during the game and prestige adjustment and may make the difference between winning and losing. By helping the civilians flee, you also prevent them from being kidnapped, which deflates morale. To do this, it costs six ops minus one ops for every insurgent present in the civilian's district, to a minimum of one. The civilian is simply removed from his district and placed in a fled civilian's box. So, the Hungarian side can move around and can help the innocent civilians flee, but they will also need to dig in and protect themselves. They do this by building barricades. To build a barricade, you need one, a hidden insurgent with a barricade icon on him, two, a number of ops equal to the number of active Soviet regiments in the district, plus one, and three, a barricade icon on one of the cards played for the ops required to take the action. 
If all three conditions are met, the hidden insurgent is revealed and a barricade token is added to the district. There can only be one barricade in each district. We discussed the protection the barricades offer against Soviet attacks in detail when I previously explained the Soviet actions. If playing the advanced version of the conflict mode, and if there is at least one rubble token in the district, a barricade may be built from this rubble for one ops cheaper. Instead of adding a barricade token, simply flip the rubble token to its barricade side. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Let's attack. Let's defiantly shake our fists at the Soviets. The Hungarians may be outnumbered and outmatched, but it will not diminish their resolve. There are two ways in which the Hungarian side may take the offensive and take the fight to the Soviets. First, the Hungarian side may ambush an active Soviet regiment or active garrison for a cost of three ops. This is the least flexible way to attack since it requires the ambushing insurgent to be hidden, to have an ambush icon on him, and for one of your played revolutionary cards to also have the ambush icon on it. The targeted Soviet unit is flipped to its inactive side and the hidden ambushing insurgent is revealed. The Hungarian side also takes one momentum marker. For every two momentum markers, Soviet prestige will decrease by one during the adjustment phase. What makes the ambush action so powerful is that the Soviet side cannot counterattack. They just have to grin and bear it. But the criteria to ambush is fairly stringent, so there is another way for the Hungarian side to attack, but it does open themselves up for a counterattack from the Soviet side and it is a little bit more risky. This is called the open attack. Just like the ambush action, an open attack costs three ops, may target and disable any active garrison or regiment, and rewards the Hungarian side with one momentum marker. But, unlike the ambush action, it may be taken by any armed insurgent. If you recall, an armed insurgent is any insurgent in the basic version, since they are all considered armed. However, in the advanced version of the game, an insurgent with an innocent bystander icon on it is not considered to be armed. If the insurgent was hidden prior to the open attack, he is revealed. I've got some bad news for you though. This additional flexibility comes at a price. Now it is the Soviets turn to counterattack. The effectiveness of their counterattack relies on a little luck as well as how ready they are as indicated by the readiness track. To counterattack, the Soviet player rolls one die and compares it to their current readiness level. There are three possible outcomes. First, if the rolled die result is three or more less than the current readiness level, the attacking insurgent is immediately killed and moved to the killed insurgent box. Obviously, this easy kill adds a little complacency to the Soviet side. To reflect this, their readiness is then decreased by one. Second, if the rolled die result is equal to one or two less than the current readiness level, the attacking insurgent is wounded. Place one wound token on the insurgent. If the attacking insurgent already had a wound token, then he is killed and moved to the killed insurgent box. Again, the Soviet side rejoices their easy counterattack, mocks the revolution, and continues to sip vodka with their dinner. Their readiness decreases by one. Third, if the rolled die result is greater than the current readiness level, the Soviets miss! The results in a slightly less cocky Soviet crew and their readiness will increase by one so that they are better prepared for next time. Insurgents attack! The revolution thrives! There are so many great tactical decisions based around the Hungarian side attacking that you're going to discover many of them on your own and then some. But I just want to ask some of the basic questions and some I've already asked. First question, who do you attack? Do you attack the regiments, the doers on the board? Do you attack the garrisons, the ones that are going to affect your morale at the end of the, the round? Either way, you're going to earn one of these momentum tokens, which is worth minus half a prestige. So that's all good. Then you need to go, where do I attack? How do I use the land? Landscape, the current landscape of the game situation to my advantage. Is the headline a distraction to the Soviet side? Is he can I do something that revolves around that? What about barricades and rubbles, the pinning rule? How do I use all of these things to my advantage? And finally, how am I going to attack? You have the overly stringent ambush, but I know I'm not going to be attacked back. There will be no Soviet counterattack. But I can also do the open assault. Now, if I do an open assault, there, I'm opening myself up to a Soviet counterattack. So where's the Soviet readiness? How can I manage that? And maybe if I'm doing an open assault, I might want to have more insurgents in that district so I can distribute the, wound, the wounds a little bit more so that they all don't get killed right away. So there's all of these different decisions to make when you go on the offensive and you got to worry about the Soviet player be getting defensive on you and 
how you're going to fit within the actual current state of the game. It's just really refreshing and great. Now if you're playing the advanced version, you may be inclined to take a few more risks because you're going to have the medic option available to you. Medics are insurgents with the medical icon on them. For one ops, you may reveal a hidden medic and either remove one wound from another insurgent in the same district as you, or hide an already revealed insurgent in the same district. When you hide an insurgent, simply choose one revealed insurgent and mix them in with any other hidden insurgents in the same district. You may use as many ops as you want or need and may reveal as many hidden medics as ops used in as many different districts as you want. Medics may not heal or hide themselves, but they may heal or hide another medic. There are a lot of benefits to having hidden insurgents since many of the actions require it, and it also increases the uncertainty to the Soviet side as to who you're actually playing with. However, there's also some benefits to have an active or revealed insurgents because you have the pinning rule and they also are useful for preventing arrests. So choose wisely. Now, we have finally made it to my favorite action of the entire game, Defy. That is, after all, the heart of any revolution, is it not? Defiance. Now, if for no other reason than the ability to take this action, you should be playing the advanced version of the game so that you can also experience the joy and thrill of the Defy action. In its most basic form, the Hungarian side spends one ops to reveal one hidden insurgent in any district, which decreases Soviet readiness by one. It gives the Hungarian side the ability to reduce the effectiveness of Soviet counterattacks. In its more sophisticated form, in the form that I'm always striving to when I play the Hungarian side, the Hungarian side may earn momentum tokens by spending one, two, or three ops if they meet three criteria when they defy. First, they must defy with an innocent bystander insurgent. Second, the insurgent must be in a district with a barricade token or rubble token. And third, that district has to have at least one active regiment in it. As before, the Soviet readiness decreases by one, but in addition, the Hungarian side is rewarded with the number of momentum tokens equal to the ops spent on this action minus one. So if you choose to spend three ops to take this action, you will earn two momentum tokens, which will decrease Soviet prestige by one whole point later. But it's totally up to you as to how many ops you want to use for this particular action. So for example, if you use two ops, you would earn one one momentum token if you met all of the three criteria I've already explained. Oh man, there are so many great reasons to defy. There's so many great opportunities to defy. In this most basic form, you could take an insurgent up in no man's land and you could defy. And in doing so, you can drop readiness down and perhaps even help the revolution by setting up an open assault with a low probability Soviet counterattack elsewhere on the board later in your turn. So there's reason for doing that. But then you can kick it up a notch. You can defy with the guy with the defiance symbol, the little AK-47, in a district with an active garrison. By doing so, you're now blocking that active garrison from counting for dropping your morale during the adjustment phase. Because sometimes you just can't get to all the active garrisons and and it costs a lot of ops to actually disable them through either an ambush or an open assault. So defy against them. Use one ops and get them to not be disabled, but not to at least count towards dropping your morale. Like it's awesome. You can defy in other regions where you want to exploit the pinning rule because now you have a revealed insurgent. You can defy in different areas where you might want to prevent a kidnapping. That might be a reason why you might want to do that. But then you can kick it up a notch even further and defy with your innocent bystander. Now when I defy with the innocent bystander, I always have visions of that, uh, that single man holding his shopping bags in 1989 Tiananmen Square standing against a big row of tanks coming at him. Now that, that's defiance. And that's the visions I have. You have this innocent person standing in front of these tanks saying, you know what, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. And then when you do it that way, you can actually earn these momentum tokens based on how many ops you choose to put towards that. So it's a really interesting puzzle is going, okay, well, I'm going to defy this way. You need to get the different situation to in place so that you can actually defy with your innocent bystander and earn these momentum tokens so you can drop prestige later. It is just so many great ways you can use this defiance mechanism and I'll leave it for you to discover more because it is just a really cool and thematic element here in the game. Finally, if there are two players on the Hungarian side, a player may give one card face down to his partner on his turn. This card counts as one of the three cards he is allowed to play but does not require any ops to 
play. This cannot be the Hungarian player's only action. He must do something else in addition to this. This is referred to as strategizing. The last game mode to discuss in the operations phase is the automated Soviet turn when playing the Konev mode. The Konev cards and their corresponding target tokens are dealt out during the tactics phase. When it is the Soviet's turn, roll a die, then follow the instructions on the Konev card with the matching target token. The target token is then moved to the next Konev card to the left if possible. Otherwise, it is moved to the Konev card on the right. Each target token will always be associated with one Konev card. The iconography and actions outlined on the Konev cards are the same as we have already discussed when we talked about the Soviet actions in the conflict mode of the game. So we're not going to discuss them again, but since this is an automated bot, we do need to spend some time understanding how it thinks and how some actions may have to be modified slightly. To do this, let's take a closer look at the cards. There are a total of 12 Konev cards in the deck. Half of the cards are district specific, as shown by the card's title, which means the card will be resolved in that particular district. The remaining six cards are not district specific. Instead, they are guided and resolved by a district's threat level or by the most number of insurgents present in a district. So where is the most threatening district that is worthy of Marshal Konev's undivided attention? Well, we'll simply work our way through a hierarchy of criteria until we find one unique district. From the most threatening to the least threatening, the threat list is number one, highest value civilian. The civilian value, as you already know, is equal to the prestige loss during the game end prestige adjustment if the civilian is able to flee. Obviously, Marshal Konev wants to make these civilians a priority. A district with a value zero citizen is still considered more threatening than a district without a civilian token at all. Number two, if you have more than one district that is tied for highest value civilian, then look for the district between these tied districts with the most insurgents. Number three, if you're still tied, find a district with an objective icon, as indicated by the red star, with no garrison present. And number four, if you're still tied between districts that have matched all of these three previous criteria, choose the district with the fewest active regiments in it. And finally, if you make it to number five, just choose randomly. The cone of cards are read from top to bottom and you simply follow the instructions of what to do. So for example, here we have the hunt card. First we select the highest threat district with an active regiment present or adjacent to it. Exactly like the conflict mode, adjacency is only considered within the same divisional sectors for the Soviet side. So we go down the threat list with the added constraint of the district also having an active regiment present or adjacent to it. For example, we have three value two civilians on the board, but only two have an active regiment adjacent or present. Of these two districts, this one has more insurgents and is therefore the biggest threat. Once identified, we immediately move an adjacent regiment into the district. If the most threatening district already had an active regiment in it, then no movement would be necessary. We continue down the card and perform the first option possible. Marshal Konev cannot arrest because one of the insurgents is revealed. The assault action cannot be taken because the barricade is present. So finally, we get to the bottom of the card and clear the barricade. But oh no, we have to do this again. Marshal Konev is a ruthless and relentless SOB. Often the highest threat district on the board will change as a result of completing a card, but in this case it does not. So we work through the card again in the same district as before. Now it is not necessary to move an active regiment into the district, so we move on. An arrest is still not possible, but now the Hungarian side finds themselves without the security and safety of their barricade that we blasted the first time we went through the card. As the name of the card implies, Marshal Konev starts to hunt and will inflict two damage on the insurgents. You will also notice that an additional damage is dealt if the Soviet readiness is four or higher. In fact, any Marshal Konev attack, whether it be with the Hunt card or any other card, is adjusted based on the Soviet readiness, which is an added use of the readiness track in the Konev mode of the game. Unlike the Conflict mode, where the Soviet player is free to distribute damage as he or she pleases, in the Konev mode there is a very systematic order that you follow in how damage is dealt to the Hungarian insurgents. Damage is dealt in order of the following. First, deal damage to wounded insurgents. If there is a kill to be made, Marshal Konev will make it. Remember, it only takes two wound tokens to kill and move an insurgent to the killed insurgent box. And second, damage is dealt to revealed insurgents. If there are multiple revealed insurgents, then they are prioritized by the potential damaging actions that they may perform, which is indicated by their icons. In order of priority, the targeted icons are first ambush, 
then counterattack, followed by innocent bystander, then defiant, then barricade, and finally medic. And finally, damage is dealt to hidden insurgents. If there is still damage to be dealt, the Hungarian side may choose the target. If playing the advanced version of the game, morale is immediately decreased by one if a hidden innocent bystander is killed. The last thing you need to be aware of when playing the Konev mode is the rather frustrating and sometimes annoying no effect rule. Well actually it's a really important part of the game and provides tension right to the bitter end because it prevents the Hungarian player from finding a deep dark corner somewhere on the board and hunkering down and waiting for the onslaught to be over. Basically, if the only effect of a Konev card is to move an active regiment and or change the Soviet readiness, then the Soviet turn is considered to have no effect. If this occurs, the Hungarian side must remove an insurgent of their choice from the board and return it to the box. On the bright side, no morale is lost as it would be if that insurgent was killed instead. Although this may actually work to your benefit on critical turns and may get you out of a jam, it is certainly not a long-term strategy. Take for example the Mobilize card. First we increase Soviet readiness by one. Then we resolve the card three times, once for the highest threat district in each of the three divisional sectors. For each sector we move all the active regiments towards the highest threat district. Now let's suppose it is a night round, so we skip the recon action. Let's also suppose that a barricade is present in each of the high threat districts, so we also skip the assault. As a result, nothing other than a readiness adjustment and a movement took place with this card, which means we must apply the no effect rule and remove one insurgent from the board. So where to begin with these Konev cards? These Konev cards are laid out five in a row and all five of them are going to be resolved during the operations phase and three of them are known so the Hungarian side can start to plan and organize themselves accordingly. But what about these two unknown Konev cards? Well, there is some things we can do, some deductive reasoning to try to figure out what some of these cards might be. For example, during the tactics phase, the first three cards are laid out and dealt out directly from the Konev deck. So if you're in the second round and beyond, that implies that there has been a discard pile of the previous Konev cards that were played in the previous round, which is five cards. So you know it can't be any of those five cards. Then you also got this additional card that's face up. Any of these face up cards, it can't be for obvious reasons. So there's eight cards that it can't be. And if in the previous round if you actually disabled at least three Soviet units you get to remove two of the Konev cards from the deck for the next round so then you know it can't be any of those cards so there's a deductive reasoning here you can never get it right down to an exact answer but it kind of reminds me a little bit of the deductive reasoning and luck that's involved in Love Letter I know these are completely different styles of games but there is that element to it when you're trying to solve out and figure out well how can I plan for uh, these different cards as best to my ability. In addition, I really enjoy how these last two cards come from dealing in the Konev deck with the discard pile from the previous round. I think that is just awesome because it reminds me of like Pandemic. When Pandemic, when you get an Epidemic, you take all of the um, discard pile from the Infection deck, shuffle them up and put them back on top. So the pain just keeps coming. And so this is the same thing here is you might get a constant pressure in a certain area from round to round to round because of this element. And I think it's a really cool way way to provide some additional tension into the game. In addition to how these cards are laid out, how the cards are resolved, the order in which they're resolved, I think is really clever and almost provides a human-like characteristic to this bot in my opinion because the way that these cards are um, resolved is through these target tokens. So you can start to figure out maybe the probabilities of what card might be resolved before another one and they're always changing because these target tokens will shift depending on what's been resolved but you can never really nail it down and similar when you're playing a player you can figure out what you think they're going to do but some players just like to throw wrenches in for the the sake of it so you never know for certain and I really like how these target tokens move around and start shifting the probabilities and shifting how you're planning and how seriously you're going to take these probabilities and how you calculate them throughout the round because it's going to alter the way you think from the beginning of the round to the end of the round and everything in between so it's really well um, orchestrated these target tokens with these um, hidden and revealed Konev cards. I really enjoy it. Well, dear viewer, 
I think we made it. I'm not going to talk about the cleanup phase that occurs at the end of each round, but I'm sure you can discover that in the rule book on your own time. Now, this game I think will appeal to many different groups. I come from the camp where I enjoy hand management, I enjoy action point allowance, I enjoy a tight, tactical, and lively game, and this game provides that on all fronts. And there's other camps who enjoy good, strategic, tactical, blocky war games, and they're also going to find this enjoyable. And I'm saying that actually is a second-hand knowledge to be honest with you because I've never played a block war game until this game but I've been told by other people who played this game who enjoy block war games and that's more their preference of game that they play that this has provided them a very tight and rewarding game as well so I had to seek their opinions on it because frankly speaking when I came into this game I'm like oh, okay block war game that's new for me but all these other cool things that I'm I, I get excited about typically when I'm looking at a game got me excited so I was really curious to see how these two worlds uh, blended together and I am absolutely impressed with how tight and enjoyable that this game is I also really enjoy the asymmetry that this game provides because honestly of all the times that I played this game I don't know what side I prefer yet because I really enjoy the Hungarian side like when you're playing a cat and mouse game sometimes it's fun to be the mouse I love screwing around like uh, and trying to anticipate where you're going to be attacked and then using the rules of the game to try to be into your work into your favor into your advantage and so that's one of these games too that requires an intimate knowledge of the rules because you need to be because since you're getting beat up so bad you need to know when and how you can use the gameplay elements to your advantage advantage but if for no other reason why you want to try this game you need to try playing the Soviet side for the mechanism where you create a tactical deck that's going to control the operations you're going to do in a, in a round and the leftovers actually get turned into your combat deck which actually affects the probability of success on some of the things you're planning in your tactics deck that is that is honestly that is my favorite part of the game um that decision and then you layer in the time of day maybe you can't do certain things you layer in if there's barricades out there you layer in if you're playing with the headlines you layer all that but all of that is stacked on top of the core of taking cards so that you can use them that round and then create being the master of your own destiny by creating a draw deck for how successful your attack actions are going to be as a soviet player when you're playing the conflict mode if for no other reason you that mechanism is you need to play the game in my opinion to experience that mechanism i'm trying to think of other games that do that um, i'm drawing a blank i can't think of that i think it is just brilliant i would love to see more of that if you can think of something uh please leave a comment for me because i that was just such a, a cool part of this game all of it was great in my opinion but again don't just take my opinion for it i encourage you to go check out the kickstarter page there's a lot of great reviewers out there that i enjoy watching as well and i like to see what their opinions are and see if they agree or disagree and see if they're more aligned with maybe your preferences and or not and if you did enjoy this video i would appreciate if you took the time to like the video and come find me on social media because i of course appreciate you taking the time to watch this video in the first place so until next time i hope you have a great day and i hope whatever game you decide to get onto the table next is one that you're going to immensely enjoy. Cheers.